pray uh, now for our remainder of our time this evening. We thank you for the opportunity for this, for the freedom, for the benefit, for the fellowship that we have with one another, having been baptized into the same body as believers and as this local church. Lord, bless our now our time in the Word. May uh, we see clearly the things which you have given to us for our, our own good, for your glory, so that we may be more like your Son, Jesus Christ, whom we've spoken about today. In your name we pray, amen. I've uh, spent uh, quite a few hours this past semester uh, at the seminary working on a paper uh, about the means of assurance of salvation. And uh, it has profited me much, and so I do not want to uh, keep that information from you, and I hope that it can be a benefit to you. So for the next, uh, I think this will be at least a two-parter, and so, but this evening I, I want to begin our topic on this idea of the means of assurance of salvation, because I fear there is much confusion about this subject matter uh, amongst even, even evangelicals today. And uh, how do we obtain that assurance? How do we obtain personal assurance of our salvation? And uh, there, are, there are many reasons for which we sometimes lack that assurance. Uh, we perhaps have doubt or uncertainty about our own state of, of eternal uh, salvation. And uh, in 1654, uh, a man named Thomas Brooks, a Puritan, wrote this about the idea or the subject matter of assurance. And he says this, Assurance is the believer's ark where he sits, Noah-like, quiet and still in the midst of all distractions and destructions, commotions and confusions. However, most Christians live between fears and hopes and hang, as it were, between heaven and hell. Sometimes they hope that their state is good, at other times they fear that their state is bad. Now they hope that all is well and that it shall go well with them forever. Then they fear that they shall perish by the hand of such corruption or by the prevalency of such or such a temptation. They are like a ship in a storm tossed here and there. Why is that, though? Why is it that we do experience doubt and uncertainty at times about our own salvation? I think we could confidently argue that at some point or another, every believer experiences those sediments of doubt or uncertainty about their own salvation during their life. It's bound to happen if it hasn't happened yet. It will, and if it's happened already, there's a chance that it may even happen again. But why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons that cause these feelings to arise, none of which are unique to one person. And I want to make that clear, uh, that the reasons for that doubt and uncertainty are not unique to any one of us. They are, they are reasons for which we all experience. And uh, these are the things which make us live between fears and hopes, as Thomas Brooks has described it. But why? why do we, what, are, what are these sediments arising from? Well, there are a number of reasons which we can mention, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but th some to think about would be, one, self-deception. Self-deception. We've, uh, we've come to the point in which we've made ourselves believe, for one reason or another, that we are not his. We're not a, children, a child of God. We haven't, we're not adopted. And so perhaps we've, we've deceived ourselves, for one reason or another, into thinking that we are not one of his children. Another reason could be belief in wrong doctrine. Perhaps you have been, uh, you have been caught by the wind of false doctrine to the point which you've been deceived by it, and that perhaps causes you, perhaps when you come back to reality, to realize that, wow, what I've believing, I have been accepting as true is not. Perhaps another reason for doubt or uncertainty is a life presently characterized by sin. Unaddressed sin that goes on in our life, I hope, causes a sense of doubt, uncertainty. Not to the point in which you 
believe that you are not eternally secure in God's hands, but that you recognize the need for repentance, for his forgiveness, and for a turning away from whatever that sin may be that is characterized in your life at that time. Perhaps another reason is just personal doubt. I want to look in Scripture. I don't want to just be naming these things off. I want us to understand that these are biblically grounded reasons. Turn to Mark chapter 9 just for a moment, or listen as I read. In Mark chapter 9, the context is that of a father who is concerned for his young son. And uh, he has had these uh, issues and uh, demons which are indwelling him. In a verse 21, his father says, so he asked his, or Jesus says, so he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I don't think what the father is saying is here that he didn't believe. He believed, but there were areas in his life which he saw almost impossible without the divine help of the Savior. And in human means, in, in human consciousness, it was, it was hard to believe that his son could be changed, could be healed. And so he said and cried out with tears, Lord, help my unbelief. Perhaps that is times in our life where we have personal doubt of our own salvation and we are left to do nothing else but cry out like this man did and say, Father, help my unbelief. And then we look to scripture and find our assurance in those promises that God has given to us. Another reason for experiencing doubt or uncertainty may be a life that is not presently displaying fruit or good works. James chapter 2. We look there for a moment. In James chapter 2, in verse 26, James writes, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We understand that it is by faith alone that we are saved. But as it has been said before, uh, faith works, meaning it produces things which are pleasing to God. They represent a change, a transformation. It represents the Spirit's indwelling and his sanctifying work. Faith is not alone. Faith produces works. So perhaps there have been times in which you find yourself at a lack of producing fruit, the Spirit's fruit, for whatever reason it may be, and that causes you to have feelings and uncertainty. Another reason may be temptation. The very fact that you are facing temptation may cause you to consider why. Why am I facing temptation? Why, is, why am I fighting so hard against the flesh? Shouldn't this be easier? Well, we know that even the believer is not exempted from temptation. True enough, a saved individual, someone that has the new nature, the temptations are, can we say, mitigated. But it is still a fight, and it's not a reason to doubt our salvation if in that moment we call upon Christ and ask for his help to overcome whatever temptation it is that's at hand. James chapter 1 verse 14 says this, 
But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Verse 15, then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Death. Again, we know that no believer is exempt from temptation. But the question at hand is, what do you do when you are faced with temptation? Do you allow it to conceive itself into sin? And then do you go back to what we said earlier, where then it becomes a life presently characterized by that sin? Or do you fight against that temptation by the Spirit's power? Another reason for experiencing doubt, perhaps, is that you are in the midst of trials. Trials have a way of doing that. We have each had our own trials, I think, this year. We all have. And perhaps in those times you wonder, God, what are you doing? Or even at you may question God's love for you at that moment. Paul writes about this very idea, though, and reminds us in Romans chapter 5. Let me turn there for a moment and read that to you. Romans chapter 5. He writes here, Therefore, having been justified by faith, not by works, by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So Paul's not saying that a presence of tribulations is a lack of the presence of God's love being poured out upon us. That's not what he's saying. He's saying we will face tribulations, but that's okay because that produces in us things which manifest God's love within us at work. So, perhaps if you are in the midst of a trial, don't don't question your salvation. Question what God is doing in that time to transform you into his son's likeness. One last reason for perhaps a reason in which you experience doubt is that there is just a general uncertainty about the sincerity of a Conversion, can I say, quote unquote, experience? I think young folks, especially, often face this. Get into your adolescent years, and you remember a time, perhaps, or a season of life in which you you had made a confession of faith, but you begin to doubt the general experience. Did I really believe? Did I, perhaps, some say, did I say the right thing? Did I believe in my heart? Did I really turn? Did I really have a transformation? And so general uncertainty about the sincerity of a conversion can cause one to doubt their salvation and cause them to have a lack of assurance. Whatever the personal reason may be for such feelings of fear or doubt or uncertainty, we know this, though, that the Christian does not need to remain in that state of doubt. Assurance of salvation produces the opposite kind of feelings. It doesn't produce fear and doubt and uncertainty. Assurance brings peace, hope, joy, and fellowship with the Heavenly Father. That's what personal, personal assurance does. That is the effects of assurance. It produces peace. You have a peace with God. Not just in a judicial sense, but also an experiential sense. You have the feelings of peace knowing that you are in the Savior's arms. And you have a hope. You have a joy and fellowship. Assurance of salvation is the personal confidence that you are in a right relationship with God. If, we can, if I can make a definition of assurance, that's how I would describe it. I think that's how Scripture describes it. It's the assurance. Assurance of salvation is the personal confidence that you are in a right relationship with God. 
Now, I want to make sure we have a clear distinction here between two different terms. There's personal assurance and eternal security. And there is a distinction between the two that we need to make sure we understand. We do not want to get these two ideas, these two doctrines, confused. Although uh, the doctrines of eternal security and assurance, they do go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. There is a distinction. And D.A. Carson defines personal assurance as the Christian's confidence that he or she is already in a right standing with God and that this will issue in ultimate salvation. That is personal assurance. Whereas the doctrine of eternal security teaches that once a person is born again, he cannot lose his salvation. We believe that the Bible teaches clearly that a born-again believer is eternally secure. There's no doubt about that. He is not at risk of losing his salvation or being cast out of God's fold. That is what Scripture promises. It teaches us that. Look with me for a moment at John chapter 10. John, tap, John chapter 10. In verse, in verse 25, Jesus answered them, that is, he's speaking here to the Jews. And he says this, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. There's the promise of eternal security. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Amen. My Father, who has given them, that is, those who are born again, to me. He is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. There's double security there. Jesus says, you can't snatch them out of my hand, and you can't snatch them out of my Father's hand. Verse 30, and I and my Father are one. We have the promise of eternal security, but I want to make sure, again, as I said a moment ago, we, we understand the distinction between the two. Eternal security is objective. It's there. It's factual. It's what the Bible says is true. By nature of the subject, personal assurance is subjective. It's, a, it's you accepting the fact that you are his. It's a confidence, as we said, a, confidence, a personal confidence that you are his. You are in a right relationship with God. So then, we ask ourselves this question, how can I obtain full assurance of my salvation? How can I personally have that assurance? On the basis of what John writes in his first epistle, a believer can obtain full assurance of salvation. That is a promise. That is something that is for us to understand and to grasp that at any point in my life, I can have full assurance, not partial assurance, not some assurance. I can have full assurance of my salvation. John writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you, that is everything he's written up before this point in his epistle, so that I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know confidence that you have eternal life. Hmm, that's right. First John includes various tests, tests that are meant to expose the genuineness of a person's faith, resulting in personal assurance. That's the point. John is writing to them so they can have that assurance. John's not writing these tests in order to create any unnecessary doubt in the hearts of true believers, but to help them in their pursuit of personal assurance. Now, it may very well be that after 
testing yourself against these things that John writes, you may find, after examining yourself, that you truly aren't in the faith. But John is not writing in a negative sense as to create unnecessary doubt. He's saying, I write these things so that you have assurance, so that you have the peace, the joy, the satisfaction, the fellowship with the Heavenly Father. In fact, John not only writes that assurance is possible, but the Apostle Peter also exhorts his reader to be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. He writes this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Peter's not just saying you can have assurance. He says, I want you to be diligent about that very thing of assuring or confirming your calling and your election. Because the Bible teaches this, that the believer can obtain full assurance and that it is something that should be confirmed personally in the mind and heart of every believer, then it's our, it's our responsibility, can I say. It's expedient that we identify the biblical means of assurance. If, we, if we've been told that we can have full assurance and if Peter tells us that we are to have that confidence, that we are to, to acquire that, to be diligent, to 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 confirm that thing, then we need to study this and find out how we can have the biblical means of assurance. So, then that brings us to the question, if the Bible says that believers can obtain assurance, how do I obtain, how do I obtain that assurance in a personal way? How do I obtain that? There are, the Bible says that we can have it. Peter says that we are to make, be all the more diligent to confirm that thing then how do I obtain it? What, what does the Bible tell me are the means of assurance? Well, think about this and dwell on this for a moment. Personal assurance rightly arises from, A, the Holy Spirit's illuminating work so that the believer eagerly accepts and embraces God's word as the truth. That is one mean. When the Spirit has illuminated you, and that means that regeneration has had to have taken place, when the Spirit's illuminated you, that means that you eagerly accept, you embrace what God has said in his word, the promises of God, as the truth. So you ask yourself this question, when I read scripture, do I embrace it as the truth? Do I believe the promises of God based on the person and work of Christ? I do? Okay. That is one that is one aspect of assurance, one means. The second one is this. And you can't have the first without the second, and you can't just have the second without the first. They go hand in hand. The second is this. A life that is presently persevering in faith, doctrine, and practice. That is the sanctifying work of the Spirit. It's looking at your life and examining yourself and saying and asking yourself this question, do I see the Spirit at work in my life? Well, what kind of work? A work that, is, that has and produces personal faith, that is, that is producing in me a, a mind and a heart that believes in right doctrine, and also right practice or fruit, good works. on a, a little deeper level when you think about this, remember this, that you can't have one of these three without the others. I said you can't have the first major means without the second major, but you also can't just have a personal faith without right doctrine or right practice. You can't just have good works and no faith. That is a dead faith. You have to have all three. They all go hand in hand. So personal assurance, rightly, again, arises from the Holy Spirit's illuminating work so that the believer eagerly accepts and embraces God's word as the truth. And from that, or by that, then, there is a life that is persevering in faith and doctrine and practice. That is the biblical means of obtaining personal assurance. And we'll look more into that in the next time that we that we talk about this. Assurance is a reward of a tested and proven faith. 
Think about that for a moment. Assurance is only deserving of, for those who have tested, who have a tested and proven faith. Otherwise, you, have, you, you are giving yourself a self-deceived assurance. You are assuring yourself on the basis of, or on the grounds of nothing. There need to be some kind of grounds for assurance. It is the Holy Spirit who gives it, not a human being. Again, he does this by illuminating us and by his sanctifying work. In that way, we are able to obtain that assurance. Now, we just said that uh, those who have a false assurance are uh, those who have not tested and proven their faith. There are many ways in which a person can be falsely assured of his salvation. I want, I want us to think about these for a moment because uh, these are more prevalent, perhaps, than you may think they are. Maybe, maybe not in our teaching, in our church here. I hope not. But they are, they are uh, means of assurance that are false. They are false means of assurance that we need to be aware of and check and examine our own life to make sure that we have not, we have not uh, if I can say, uh, made them inspirational or, or inspired means of assurance. If they're not in Scripture, then they are not uh, to be used as a means of assurance. What are these various false means of assurance? Well, a person can be falsely assured of his salvation if there's just a general presence of visible morality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, many people falsely rest on their quote-unquote good behavior. In reality, there seems to be people in the world that are truly honest, upright, and kind. We know people like that. In fact, embarrassingly so, there are some people that act more like Christians than sometimes Christians do. The Pharisees in Jesus' day believed that their so-called righteous behaviors were enough to get them into God's good graces, if we can say that. But Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be a producer of good works. No, he must be born again. The works will follow. People who have a perception of visible morality have no true knowledge of a sincere love for God if they have not been born again. This can lead to a false means of assurance or a false assurance in their life. Visible morality is not a means of assurance. True enough, I hope a born-again believer will show visible signs of morality, but it is not the means it is the effects of being born again in the Spirit's work. A person can also be falsely, falsely assured of his salvation by mere intellectual knowledge. Someone who rests upon their intellectual knowledge can falsely assure themselves that they are saved when they truly and actually in reality are not. I think that perhaps this is most dangerous to those who are in the church? What do I mean? Well, children who grow up in Christian homes attend church through their adolescent years and teenage years and have made a so-called profession of faith can easily become falsely assured by their intellectual knowledge that they have, perhaps we can say about Jesus or the Bible or the Christian faith, but have never truly believed with genuine saving faith in a way that is transformative, in a way in which they are believing with a repentant faith. While knowledge of the truth is necessary for saving faith, we need to know what the Bible says. We need these facts. Saving faith pertains to more than mental acuity. It's more than the intellectual knowledge Remember what James chapter 2, verse 19 says? Even the demons believe and tremble. They're not born again. The book of Hebrews, the author here, describes kind of a similar kind of people group, if we can group them in kind of, of a clump. These people have tasted salvation, so to speak. 
They have seen the Spirit at work in people. They have seen answered prayer. They have seen God at work. They know all that they could about God and the gospel truths, but without ever embracing it personally. They know it up here, but as they say, they don't know it here. It has not transformed them. They have not truly displayed saving faith. So visible morality, intellectual knowledge, also another false means of assurance is just mere religious involvement. Religious involvement is not a proof of saving faith. Many people are falsely assured of their faith faith because they rely upon the external appearance of godliness that likens them to the true possessors of saving faith, but they're not. Do not be deceived believing that the appearance of godliness is proof of saving faith. Again, this is another false, this produces a false sense of assurance that is not genuine. You can attend church, you can be baptized, you can be involved in every ministry out there, but mere religious involvement is not proof of saving faith. Another Perhaps reason for false assurance is just general guilt over sin. General guilt of sin. There is, let's be clear about this, there is a distinction between guilt over sin and sorrow that leads to repentance. I think perhaps we can still say in our world today, there are people that are still guilt-ridden, who acknowledge that they have done things that are wrong, but they lack the conviction, a sorrowful spirit that leads to repentance. People acknowledge uh, on a very base level that they've done wrong things, and, and that may even cause guilt to some extent, maybe just because of the fact that they've been caught, or maybe they recognize that they've hurt someone by their choices. So people do have a sense of guilt and I think we could say that uh, perhaps that is, if, if anything, just a small expression of the human conscience which God has placed in every person. But it has been darkened by their sin nature. And therefore, there is no sorrowful spirit that leads to repentance. They have guilt, but without a sorrow that leads to repentance. But, again, they use this sense of guilt over sin as a means of assuring themselves that they are saved when they're truly not. Finally, one last, or two last ones, excuse me. Another way a person can be falsely assured of his salvation is just the general feelings. Feelings of assurance. People love to use feelings, their emotion, as a driving force of assuring themselves that I'm saved. True enough, personal assurance is subjective by nature, like we said, but the means of assurance do not rely upon merely feelings. Someone may say, yeah, I know I'm a Christian because I feel like one, or I look like one. But this is a faulty reasoning, and we know that self-deception is possible. We've talked about this idea of self-deception a lot lately. And they have deceived themselves by their feelings to cause themselves to believe that they are in a place in which they're actually not. They think they're safe where they're on the brink of condemnation, God's judgment. Now, true enough, assurance is experiential. To not have feelings of joy or peace or hope would be very strange. A person that is saved and has that assurance has feelings of joy, of peace, and hope. But the feelings are not the grounds nor the means. They are, they are the effects of assurance. You have tested yourself. You, you have examined yourself. You have full confidence 
because of the diligence that you've shown to confirm your calling, and therefore you sit down, you sigh with, a, with relief, and you have joy and peace. They are not the driving force for assurance. They are the result of assurance. Finally, a last reason which a person can be falsely assured is perhaps just a time of decision. So often people say things like, well, I know I'm a Christian because I remember when I signed that card or I remember when I prayed a prayer or I remember when I walked the aisle or went forward in church. A person may remember exactly when it happened and where they were when it happened. And I say, quote unquote, happened. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Our salvation is not verified by a past moment. Many people have prayed prayers, gone forward in church services, gone into prayer rooms, been baptized, and joined churches without ever experiencing genuine saving faith, unfortunately. Now, let me clear, be clear. I'm not saying that to have a record of a certain date when you believed is wrong. That is all very well. But, never, but not everyone has had that same kind of conversion experience. So we do not dismiss them into saying, well, then, you know, you're not saved. No, that's what we're saying here at this moment, that a time of decision is not the proof of saving faith. What I am saying is that you must be careful to not allow a date to falsely assure you of something that did not actually happen. What happens, what is important, is not the date or the time or the event or where it was. It's that God, by his spirit, has regenerated you, and you are born again. That is the significant time and moment, not just the time of decision. In the last few moments, I want to uh, speak about something that pertains to this whole topic because there is a past and present attack on the biblical means of assurance. We've listed just a few of them. Perhaps we could say these are Satan's methods of attack by giving false assurance where it's not deserved. But unfortunately, because of men and our fallenness, we've also produced doctrines and teachings that can also give false senses of assurance as well. And in recent decades, uh, there is a great concern, I hope and I think, uh, by what I read and see, among theologians to maintain a biblical view of the doctrine of assurance. As it's been increasingly undermined by a widespread acceptance of certain theologies taught by some evangelicals and I'm not trying to beat around the circle, but what is called often free grace theology, sometimes uh, use the term easy believism. And this, I believe, this kind of theology is dangerous in this way. It undercuts, it undermines the biblical means of assurance. This movement uh, of easy believism or free grace undermines at first, even just in the essence, the gospel message and what, it, what is the gospel message. And that trickling effect then leaks into the means of assurance. If you don't have a right theology of, of what it means, uh, what the gospel message is, then when it comes to the, to the topic and subject matter of personal assurance, you're going to be falsely assured in things that are not actually biblical because you didn't have a biblical doctrine of, of the gospel. The gospel message is a message of repentant faith. And although proponents of free grace claim that justification is by grace alone, if you read their material and read this and study it, they will admit that, that, that justification is by grace alone. Let, let me stop here for a moment. There are, I'm going to say some things that sound like I'm being very uh, attacking this view. I am not saying here that there are that if not almost all of the people that teach this are not genuine saved individuals. What I am saying is that uh, we need to be careful that we understand the gospel message that it is by grace alone, by faith alone, and that we need to make sure that we understand that our, the results of that are ones that are characterized by a life that looks like Christ's. 
So, as I said a moment ago, uh, these proponents of free grace believe that justification is by grace alone, a belief that is historically aligns with our teaching and other teachings, the Reformed theologians. The problem lies in their understanding of the word alone. What is justification by faith alone? These theologians have explained alone to mean that not only can a person do nothing to help or add merit to obtaining justification, okay, I think we can settle on that and say, I agree, but they go beyond that by saying this, that God also requires nothing more than faith when he justifies us. Okay, we we still somewhat can agree, that's true. But from the surface, again, as I just said, this presumably looks like a theologically accurate statement. Nothing more than faith alone. But what they are really saying here, that when they say nothing more is required than faith, he's saying they are explaining it in this way. What faith really is in biblical language is receiving the testimony of God. It is the inward conviction that what... uh, that what... It says to us in the gospel is true. So they're looking at it from a merely an intellectual way. Intellectual assent. Yes, I believe what God's word has said. I believe that the gospel is true. I'm saved. That's it. I'm good. I'm fine. However, as we said earlier, intellectual assent to the truth is not enough, since James writes that even the demons believe and shudder and tremble. As it correlates to assurance, uh, Wayne Grudem, a theologian, points out that proponents of free grace theology are unashamed to argue that people who accurately understand the gospel, mental acuity, and sincerely said that they believed in Christ at some time in the past, but now say that they no longer believe in Christ, are likely to still be saved. And we can assure them that they are saved. You recognize the dangerousness of that? Now, let me be clear again, and and I want to accurately represent them. Not all of them would go that extreme in saying those kind of things. We understand that... uh, there are, the Bible teaches of those who uh, profess to believe and never truly were saved. And there are some proponents of this that I think would accept that, the fact that uh, they believed, and now they're saying they don't believe, and they would confirm or affirm with us and saying, okay, that person, yes, that person was never truly saved. But there are some that when this, when this theology is taken to the end, the most extreme view, it can end up in things like this, and that's why we need to be careful in our theology and our understanding of the gospel message. Another thing that they would freely and unashamedly say is that a single one-time appropriation of God's gift results in a miraculous inward transformation that can never be reversed. And that we miss the point to insist that true saving faith must necessarily continue. So they are advocating that because of the way in which God's gift operates, once you are saved, you're saved. It's as, almost as if you're stuck. Like, I don't want to be here. I want to get out, but there's no way. Well, we understand, again, as we said earlier, that's, that is a, a uh, manifestation that there was not a heart of belief to begin with. Consequently, this can result in offering false assurance to someone who has never actually exercised true saving faith. Another statement that they would make is that they would argue that a professing Christian sinful conduct should not ordinarily be used as a basis for warning the person that he or she might not be saved. Well, what is 1 John doing? It's presenting tests in which we say, in which we are to examine ourselves to see whether we abide in him or not. And the person that abides obeys his commandments. If you love me. Yeah, keep my commandments. Amen. 
One more thing, additionally, in an area which the reformers view as a pertinent subject to the subject of assurance, these theologians state that a professing Christian's righteous and godly conduct of life should not ordinarily be used as one basis for giving that person assurance of salvation. But again, I implore you to think on 1 John and other areas of Scripture which say, examine yourself, test yourself, so that you can have full confidence. And the full confidence from, comes from looking at your life and examining yourself and saying, I have personal faith, I have a doctrine that matches what the Bible says is true and accurate, and I am producing fruit of the Spirit. But now you're going to tell me that the fruit is not a basis for which I can obtain personal assurance? What do I look to then? Well, it causes you to have to look back to the one-time experience. That, well, I guess I made the decision, so that settles it. These statements should be alarming, as this theological position consequently has led many individuals to be falsely assured of their salvation because they have been convinced that a one-time profession of faith in Christ without a change of mind or will is an adequate means of full assurance that they are saved. But as we conclude here this evening, let me remind you that the Bible teaches that personal assurance does not arise from any one sort of one-time profession of faith in the right facts or a date penned in the front of a Bible but through the illuminating and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. To reduce the means of assurance to a mere profession or prayer or date in the Bible undermines the means of assurance that the Bible offers. And that is to be our sole source of assurance. What does the Bible tell me are the means of obtaining personal assurance? Not what my front cover tells me but what the contents of his word say. Do I eagerly accept them as the truth, demonstrating that I have the Spirit's work at me, in me, producing in me works, or is it something else? Let's pray as we close this evening. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I know our time is exhausted. Lord, I pray that our, our minds, though, are still willing and desiring to further investigate this matter as it pertains to our lives in a very personal way. And Lord, it, it even pertains to the season in which we are celebrating, the season of celebrating your birth, the birth of your son. Because as we celebrate him as the, the Messiah, our Savior, having come to earth, Lord, we we celebrate him as our savior, personally. But on what basis do we do that? It's because of the full assurance that we have that he, that son, that one that was born to a virgin, is our savior. He is my savior. And Lord, I pray that this evening, as we reflect upon that, that it produces in us peace, joy, and fellowship with the Heavenly Father that is unmatched by anything else that the world can offer. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen.